uh, one year ago, or almost one year ago, I started working at Tink. And my first question, uh, assignment was to start getting some control of the data export from our live systems into uh, our uh, analytics environment. Since there were a job running, uh, no one really cared about it. Uh, it took to export all the data around 24 to 36 hours. No one but really know. We had no monitoring, we had no continuous delivery on it, and it really needed some love. And as the first uh, designated data engineer at Tink, uh, that became my assignment to uh, give it some love, basically. And when this first task was done, or let's call it done, uh, I told my product manager that, hey, yeah, now uh, this thing is running and is finished within uh, 36 hours, or in, within six hours from 36 hours. Uh, and he asked me, how did you do that? And I didn't really answer him. Uh, but then this summer I was reading the excellent book, The Phoenix Project, which is about uh, IT organization moving from a traditional IT organization into the more DevOps and agile world. And they are taking a lot of examples from manufacturing pipelines, how they are working, and uh, the methodology for ways of manufacturing uh, that are used there. And I got a bit of epiphany and realized that, hey, this is actually what I'm doing all the time when uh, improving and working with data pipelines. And it also things that I have done when I'm working with build system or other kind of system that have some kind of flow. And I realized that not a lot of people know that there are actually methodologies to doing this. And therefore I created this talk and want to describe how you can do this and basically also answer the question to my product manager how I did this. Uh, who am I? You saw the presentation there. I'm Magnus Gunnarsson. I work as a data engineer at Tink and I have been working in the data engineering field for a long time. I've been at Spotify, Svenska Spel and a lot of other organizations before. And uh, Tink is maybe not that well known. Uh, we are quite small company of uh, 250 employees. Uh, our main office is in Stockholm. We have engineering offices in Warsaw and in Bratislava. Uh, we are providing uh, services for fintechs and banks uh, to help them integrating and working with open banking. We are saying that we are the rails and the brains of open banking. So we both provide some infrastructure to work with open banking. That means access account information from other banks and so on. And we also work, uh, which is the brain part, uh, to enrich and improve this data so you can take decisions or helping you to get financial information. But Today, I'm not going to talk on what we are doing. I'm going to talk on more the technical things. So the agenda for today, uh, the introduction, which I'm soon finished with after this. And then let's go into the problem description a little bit more. And uh, after that, let's walk through the process. I'm going to go through it step by step and give some examples. And then we wrap it up and repeat the process and giving some advice when doing this kind of work. I don't know how many meetings I've been sitting in and people have said, it's not fast enough. And it's very tough situation to sit in if you are not having any numbers, if you don't have any requirements, since this can mean a lot of different things. I remember one meeting that I sat in uh, uh, one, two years ago uh, that we had deployed a completely new pipeline of data processing. And then uh, sitting with uh, the uh, 
stakeholders, and they said that this is too slow, it must be faster. Okay, so what was the speed of the old pipeline? We don't know. Okay, so how can you say it's slower? No, but it needs to be faster. Okay, take it from the other way. What is your requirement of this? We don't know what requirement we have. So I, at that point, I wished I would enter that project a little bit earlier, since that should have been asked much, much earlier in the project. Another time, uh, we had issues on, sometimes the data came in early in the morning and everything works fine. And other times it uh, came at noon, uh, which was really, really too late. And uh, we didn't have any insight what was happening uh, or having the predictability of when it was delivered. Uh, and we really started to having that. That was when people said, it's too slow. They meant that I want to know when it comes in. I don't care if it comes in at six o'clock or eight o'clock in the morning. I don't want to know when it comes in and that you can uh, promise that. So this is the kind of discussions that is important to be able to have and drive as a data engineer and to help the stakeholders to understand how to formulate the requirements and then for us as data engineers to fulfill them. So uh, let's start with the process. Uh, a couple of steps, let's go through one by one. The first one is basically a recommendation I got from my math teacher. Start when you're having a problem, do a small sketch to understand how it looks like. It can be a very simple graph or you can do a very simple picture of something. Uh, by this, you get some mean to start understanding and you also are using different parts of your brain which gives you better understanding. And it's easier to talk to other people about it. So going back to this data export that I talked, that I started with at Tink, uh, we had a bunch of databases. There were some kind of job that took these, read from these databases and wrote it down into the storage bucket. Then we have another job that loaded the data into BigQuery from uh, this storage packet. And uh, this helps quite a lot. We can start reasoning about it. We know that we have several databases. We know where we come from and where we end up. Uh, but I lack one uh, important information. And that's that I want to have some time perspective. By adding the time perspective on this, I see where it takes most time, and I also get an understanding how long time it takes. Hopefully, I can get some statistics and understand how much, uh, how long time it takes for different days. Is it uh, that it delivers at 2200 every day, or is it uh, sometimes delivered at uh, 1800 and sometimes at free in the night the next day. Uh, it's really helpful to get this information. Uh, but it's not always this easy to visualize it. Most often it looks more like this. I don't intend you to read everything, but I want to exemplify it. And you get a lot of complex dependencies. And keep this picture in mind during the rest of the presentation, since I have simplified it uh, to be able to reason and showing what I want to show. But the real case you most probably want to work, work in is when it looks like this, or probably you have tons of different uh, of these graphs uh, fitting together, and then it starts re becoming really complex. Okay, we have a picture. Next important, which I was, already talking about in the problem statement, is the requirements. We need to get some kind of requirements. And it's so often that you really can't get any requirement uh, request or uh, uh, requests from the stakeholders. They say, I don't really know it's good to have, or they say, fa uh, as fast as possible, which is not really a good answer. Uh, 
And at those times, you need to reason about it. And uh, that was the case I had to do at Tink. Uh, I realized that, hmm, it's, we want to run this daily. And I know that uh, the analyst come in at around eight, nine. So yeah, it's a good enough requirement to start working with. Since I need this requirement to understand when to stop iterating over this process. Otherwise, I will continue forever and I can spend how much money there are available to just data processing and make things faster. And that's not beneficial for the industry, uh, for the company. Other times, you can have really strict uh, requirements where they say it needs to be in at most three hours after midnight and you can only be delayed mm, not more than 30 minutes and uh, that can not happen more than once a month or something like that. Then you really know what you are up to. But in my case here, yeah, it's good enough uh, when the uh, analysts come into office and I need to be aware that this might change over time. Okay, now we have some nice picture of knowing what to do and we also uh, have what the requirements are. So first thing we want to do is to start breaking down things to see if we can gain a bit more knowledge since this does not give that much. It says that we read a couple of databases. We don't really know how many tables and so on. So uh, started to break it down and see what's happening and realized that in this example, in re reality, it was many more tables, but we are reading four different tables and we are reading them sequentially. That's interesting since that is a way to stopping up our processing. Uh, we can also see, uh, you maybe not see it that well in the colors I see here, uh, but table four is from another database. It's a little bit other colors. Uh, that's also an interesting information since that can impact how we are uh, optimizing. So now we start to understanding and be able to see, hey, we can do a lot of things here. I'm pretty sure most of you or all of you have uh, quite good of understanding what's happening. So next step I decided to take uh, was to start parallelizing thing. And uh, let's start. I run everything at one time. And I did this presentation in-house and I, uh, up when showing this and saying that let's start parallelizing that, I looked on one of our uh, sysadmins and he get more or less red in his face when I was doing this and that's what will happen here. You as a data engineer need to take care about the, and think about the infrastructure around you. If you're doing this, uh, and especially if you have a lot of tables, you will take down the live infrastructure that you're reading from. So we can't really do like this. We need to read in parallel. So table one, two and three is from one database. So those we are reading in serial and then Table four is from a completely other database that is not uh, interconnected with the other one. And then we can read in parallel. Good, it's moving forward. We are, we were on like 24 hours. Now we are about 18 hours. That's quite a bit of improvement just of uh, doing parallelization of one thing there. Uh, but another thing that very common it's that we get idle times. You saw the gaps in it. And if you're scheduling your jobs using cron, for instance, then if that runs once an hour and then do a check if it can run, uh, if what it depends on is already a minute after the hour, then you have 59 minutes, uh, 59 minutes that you are uh, idling which are not doing that you could be really valuable to be using. And uh, if you are really unlucky, then you might 
have, that you have this check that you need to do every hour takes a long time. I was uh, handling a big system a couple of years ago that used Luigi, which every time started looking back for 90 days and see if the day and data was there and see what it needed to run for, even it, if it was interesting in a little bit in, uh, for the most current. And it turned out nobody observed this until we started using this process uh, that the time it took to check if the job was ready to run took actually longer time than running the job. And then uh, you're having a bit of problem and you need to tune that uh, to be better. So my recommendation is to use some kind of dependency scheduled uh, system where you can trigger automatically the next job when all its dependencies is ready. So if we look on our example again, uh, we can obviously remove a lot of slots by saying that, yeah, when table one is done, we can start uh, from right into the bucket, we can start uh, write it into BigQuery. And that doesn't matter that it's run in parallel uh, with the export of table two, since the uh, Google buckets and the BigQuery, it can handle the load, it's built for that. It's the MySQL database that I'm reading from that I worried about or whatever database I want to use. So this makes actually that we cut the time even more. So we're down to about 12 hours. It's half the time. And we have only started understanding the problem breaking it down and connecting it. So now it can start to become a bit more tricky. We need to find if we have any bottlenecks can, and can we adjusting more? It's now it's starting to like requiring a bit of thinking. And uh, let's look on this again. We see that we have a bottleneck of table one, two, and three in sequence, and that's basically what is delaying. So we can take a talk with our DBA and see, can we actually parallelize table three uh, export uh, at the same time that we are reading table one and then table two? Can the database handling that? And uh, by having this discussion, having tried out and see what load we actually are putting on the production database, we hopefully get a positive answer. And by this, we see that uh, we have cut the time even more. Uh, we are down to 80 showers, which is starting to be pretty good. Uh, and if we have the requirement that we should be ready uh, when the analysts come in, that means that uh, we are about that goal actually and can stop uh, doing this, uh, assuming that we start at midnight. Uh, but this, with, uh, this example of bottlenecks is quite example, uh, um, easy to see. Uh, sometimes it can be more complex. And let's look on a completely other example uh, where we have a couple of tasks. And if you should decide where should I spend my time, it's uh, hopefully quite obvious. But if you don't have this picture in front of you, you will not be able to see that there are actually uh, a critical path here that you should focus on. Since if you say it down and start focusing on op optimizing task five, nothing will change in the total time of delivery. You will only shorten that part. So where you should spend your time is on task one, two, and six. And which one of these, it's not obvious. Uh, there's a lot of experience looking on, but an indication is that task two takes a lot of time. So it's worth uh, start thinking about that and see what we can do if we don't see any obvious low hanging fruits on the other ones. And we can also see that task one and two will be on the critical path even if we optimize task six a little bit. 
So task one and two is probably the most interesting. And with this information, we can really start zooming in. Most junior uh, engineers I work, have been working with start often with this zooming in and jumping into the code, but not knowing where in this understanding uh, they get this impact. And in many cases, the impact of the performance of your job is none. Uh, so if and you had got this all information before, then you will end up in doing the wrong job. So thanks to all the steps we have done, we can now start optimizing. If it's uh, see if we need to paralyze the individual job more, if we can use a better algorithm, if we can optimize our code or whatever we want to do. So let's look on the process again. We start with visualization. Visualization to grab and understand better. Uh, we ensure that we get the correct requirements so we know what we are targeting. And with this, we then can jump in to the four next steps, which we can, I took them in one order here. You can do it in many different orders. It most often come natural, but it's uh, a free way to do it. And you pr most probably also iterate over them since after you have uh, paralyzed and removed idle time, maybe you can paralyze a little bit more since you're always learning all these. And in the final, you do zoom in. But I really recommend going through uh, these uh, more reddish uh, bullets uh, several times and looking how far and, and, and ensure you've got understanding. And maybe going back to understand the requirements uh, better uh, and see if you can fine tune them and know what you need to target. And a recommendation I want to have here is that use some kind of dependency scheduler so you don't have the cron. Both that you get a lot of values, that you get metrics uh, out of how long does the job takes, but you also trigger the job instead of waiting of things. Uh, and it's also much easier to understand and see how the jobs are connected. And talking about metrics, look on the metrics, use these metrics to argument that, well, this is good enough for the requirements we have, or we know that this pipeline does not take longer time than the old one, or if it does that we need to do something about it. And you can use these metrics to make a really clear stand and making clear that I, this, we have data for this and this is what it's actually mean. And then you skip a lot of inconvenient discussions. Work with the bottleneck when entering, once entering the code. It's the bottleneck that you should focus on, nothing else. Everything else is that it gives no eff effect. You can uh, spend your time on doing other things instead then. And uh, by knowing this and be pointing out that and be able to explain for others why you are focused on that component and not any other component will also help you get prioritized in this work. And the absolute, absolute most important uh, thing here is that stop when it's good enough. If you don't know your requirements, you will not know when good enough is. But if you know uh, your requirement, you can really argue and stop when it's uh, done. I realized I speak a little bit too fast, so I hope we have a couple of questions. <laughs>